So again, in principle, we can we should be able to predict uh, structure from sequence because proteins fold from sequence and they don't need anything else. Uh, but we cannot. Uh, we can do sequence comparisons. We can do sequence profile comparison, profile profile comparison. So we can see whether a pair of proteins in particular realms here has similar structure, but we cannot quite predict it if, if we don't know. We can predict it through homology modeling, and with that we sort of cover half of the database. That simply uses the feature that similar proteins have similar 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 sequences have similar structures. And again, we can sort of half, half the protein universe we can do. Bad news is, for most of the proteins, we cannot do anything. We can also not use sort of MD simulations to predict uh, structures. We can use that sort of thing for some short proteins, but it's not good enough to do everything. We can also not use Google Fold. Uh, maybe one day we can. Today, it's just not available for that scale of things. So currently, it's not available at all, but it may become available for some proteins, but at this point, at least not on that scale. So that scale being 75 million proteins, for instance. And what is available on that scale is simplified prediction method. We begin with secondary structure prediction. Secondary structure in the terms of alpha helix and beta strand, that's the way we are going to simplify the problem. Both are stabilized by hydrogen bond formation. So again, is one is intrinsically a 1D feature. Comparative modeling can sort of model half of all the proteins. It's a little bit less on the, in terms of residues, not quite half of all the residues, but, but still. Um, and we are, again, DSSP, we're looking at secondary structure from DSSP. I showed you that particular peptides are always observed in the helix, others in the strand, loop, and some peptide, peptides in both, because secondary structure formation is not only local. Uh, Helix is more local than beta strand, but somehow ultimately both of them have some non-local components to their formation, and that leads to the situation where, uh, depending on how the environment looks, uh, the pentapeptides would be either here in the beta strand or in, uh, in, in the alpha helix. The simplest solution for secondary structure prediction, in fact, uh, take known structures, find the con longest consecutive runs of motifs that are currently once in, in, in one of the three states. This will cover some, that would be sort of the simplest signal structure prediction method that I can, since you find the helices from the database that you have. Uh, but the problem really is you will not cover every single protein. And the first really simpler uh, first method was even simpler than that. Uh, that goes back to secondary structure being postulated in PNAS, and that brought St. Gurgi, and shortly thereafter, sort of five, six years thereafter, to the idea of having a secondary structure prediction method. That was the first secondary structure prediction method. In fact, it simply said that a proline breaks a helix. Since a proline breaks a helix, wherever I see a proline before was a helix, afterwards there's not. So that's the simplest signal structure prediction method you have, was then published in science. Uh, and again, mind you, this is 57, first structure is 58, uh, 60, so that predated the first structures. Um, but the person behind it is Shen Gurji, who in fact got uh, a Nobel Prize for something related to vitamin C, which is interesting because another person who sort of developed or, or got a Nobel Prize for vitamin C is Linus Pauling. For, for re worked on it, didn't get a Nobel Prize for it, but worked on it. Okay, uh, again, proline breaks the helix, as simple as that. Now, if we sort of generalize from proline for all, I simply do uh, a matrix in which I compile the probabilities for a particular amino acid to be in a particular secondary structure, and then I do a greedy approach. We talked about that. And that gets us to methods that were published by, initially by Charles Fassman, uh, Barry Robson, uh, and then later in this first Gore method here, typically referred to as GO1, and they ultimately all use single amino acid features to predict secondary structure uh, in just in, in the local environment. How would we assess performance? So the simplest one is essentially, well, in order to do that, you have to first sort of get a data set. The data set came from uh, DSSP, Chris Sander and uh, Wolfgang Kapsch. To Sander uh, is one of the most cited people, of the 300 most cited people ever in science at this point, I believe. Uh, this is an old, uh, I believe, I can't remember what his number of citations is, but 300,000 or something like that. Uh, is currently at 
Harvard University. Um, and so that allows us to sort of es estimate how good these prediction methods are. Uh, and again, one way to measure it is by simply counting for every single position. That's a typical secondary structure for that particular protein. That's a typical prediction of a secondary structure. And the simplest thing is you simply call match states, refer to as the Q3 uh, from this book here. It's a three state uh, accuracy there where you simply count it. What's the fraction of corrective predicted helix, strand, other? Three states. As simple as that. Uh, and the number published on this particular, on these methods was sort of 63. When the SSP came out and when this was rechecked, uh, reassessed, it appeared that the performance is sort of 50 to 55 percent. Uh, now the first question to the 50 to 55, again we talked about that, is it good or not? The first question you will ask, what is random? Uh, now there are two ways of, of doing, of, of thinking about random. One is just flipping a coin, sort of 30, if they were equally distributed as 33, if they are not equally distributed, the number must be higher, right? That's very clear. And that's ultimately Paul's point, uh, because if, if I had a method that is less than random, I could flip it, which impl imp implies immediately uh, that, in fact, an equal a non-equal distribution will lead to a, a higher random. In this particular case, for the given state of uh, the situation, the random is about 35%, roughly. But this is random. It's not the highest state. So 47% of all the residues are other, state other. If you always predicted other, you would get numbers that are 47 in, in a, they are not that far away from that performance, but that's a dumb prediction. This is sort of optimizing the Q3, but really not doing anything in terms of secondary structure, because we always say there is no secondary structure, essentially. There's only one state that I predict, right? Uh, but these kind of background things you always have to look at. Now, what would you do to improve? We discussed it, or you already came up with that idea. You look at segments rather than isolated amino acids. Uh, and by the way, that was in fact behind developing DSSP. They wanted to have sort of a segment-based prediction method initially. Uh, later came a method that you know, the biology of it was, imply, uh, was, was implemented by John Garnier, uh, the math by Oscar Thorpe and, and Robson. Uh, and the performance that these methods essentially got is sort of 55 to 60 percent. Again, it's a conditional probability. So you compute the probability that the central uh, parole line, now flanked by other residues, is still breaking a helix. That ultimately is the idea, right? Problem of that method is, well, the first thing here is it's not reaching 100 percent. And since at that point we're talking about the 90s, people had tried many different methods, and all these methods sort of had hit the same ceiling round about uh, 60%. Uh, and then the argument was that the max would be sort of 65. In those days people believed the number is not actually 60 but 65, so that's why this number here is 65. Why, would, why, why could we imagine that they argued that way? Why would they argue, why could anybody argue that there's a highest possible number? Uh, so the segments that Go puts in is an, are in the ballpark of 7 to 17 residues. And when many different methods do not hit much over the 60%, 60 to, to 60 something percent, then that is in fact exactly what they try. They try to make the, the segment longer, but they still don't get over it. Now they are, the idea is maybe this is related to the fact that in fact second researcher formation somehow is local and maybe uh, is, is somehow is global, right? So part of the information for second researcher formation is in the local part, that's what I see in the segment, and part is what is in the global part, which I do not see in the segment, for that the protein has to fall. It finds its way, but as long as I don't put the entire sequence in there, I cannot find it. Okay, that's why I don't put the correlation into my, my issue. And then what I would expect if that were the case, I would expect that if I looked at the beta strand performance, then the beta strand performance would be lower because beta strand is less local than alpha helices. And indeed, this is exactly what I observe. Beta strand performance is sort of 40%. Uh, for some methods, beta strand, in fact, again, is below random. In this case, as we discussed, uh, you cannot just flip because you cannot flip for one state. Uh, now, there is another issue that traditional secondary structure prediction methods have that predict short segments. Let me illustrate this on this observation. And again, imagine this in principle has to be one beta strand, one, so this has to be EE. Uh, 
and this E has, has to have a second E, I should correct for that. Uh, now if that were the extra prediction that you have, you know that helices cannot be two residues long. So in this particular case you do not know, do I cut the helix here or do I make it longer? The same thing is here, well this is a sort of real uh, helix length. Uh, but you also know that typically E's are not isolated E's. So is this sort of longer? Is this helix actually an E? Is this helix an E? Or are there none? So the usefulness of a prediction that sort of has the, some of the elements right, and by the way this I believe is exactly the 55% Q3 in this particular case, uh, but it is not that helpful because the segments are too short. Now, one hope is that we can address all of these problems by introducing machine learning, or was. Uh, and here, let's begin with the simplest idea of machine learning, a new network where you have input units, you have connections, and you have an output unit, or units, a layer of units. The way the computation is done, you have a value of the input unit, here one, you multiply it with this connection, in this particular case it happens to be uh, 1, so 1 times 1. Uh, that is what comes into here. You do the same here, comes into here, you sum these two, and then you have some trigger function. So essentially summing these two uh, is um, implying that what you do is you do a vector product. You multiply this vector of input units with a vector of connections. These are the two vectors. You project one onto the other, essentially. That's what this operation does, nothing else. And the trigger function, uh, some sigmoid function, for instance, the hyperbolic tank, uh, is such that if the value, to, if the sum over these values here is high positive value, you switch it to one. If it's a high negative value, you switch it to zero, and some sort of differentiable shape in between. Uh, this is essentially the entire operation. And with that operation, what you can do, you can classify points, open and, uh, dark circles, you uh, can train to, to classify them. Now, training to classify them with the first initialization of those connections, you get a certain error because you get an output. You know what you want, you know what you have, you do a sort of square root of the, or the square of the same, you sum over the square, and that's your error. And then you train the system by simply, if that is your error space, up goes with more error, that's the connection space, you walk down the, the error landscape, right? So you go down such that uh, you choose the, the change the, the connection such that the error decreases. And the way you do that is essentially you present to the system the, the samples and go one step down. So this example, but I don't have the patience to go through it, essentially gives the example how to do this for this simple example. What you produce with that is a line in space. So shown are here four different lines that all completely correctly classify those points. Uh, how would the line look for these points? Does somebody have a line or? Does it have to be linear? That is one, one way the line could look. <laughs> exactly. Well, in this particular case, the line has to be linear, so this is not quite an option. You could do it with two lines, but you cannot actually do it with one line. Uh, and the, the essentially two lines, you introduce a second line by a hidden layer. Okay, this is sort of a simplified way of saying that. Uh, now, when we think, think about deep learning, it's not that with every layer now we get a new line. So then we get into a hyperspace, and in fact the hyperspace comes already by exploding the number of hidden units. Uh, a second line, ultimately this introduces a second line, the number of hidden units goes up, implies we get to a higher dimensional space and things get no longer that simple to interpret. Uh, but ultimately this, it is called hidden layer, simply because this in, is the input, you see that, this is the output, and in between there's just some computation. The way the computation goes, just the same as before, you have an input, you multiply it with a connection, input with a connection, uh, you sum over the inputs to, to that unit, uh, you apply the trigger function, then you do the same thing again, that is the input coming here, you multiply it with a connection, do sum, so you do this and that, you sum over all of that, and then you apply the trigger function again. It's just repetition of the same thing. And in this repetition of the same thing, so the second one is the, uh, the nonlinear step, 
uh, you have a simple error and you simply change the connection by going downhill. The way you go downhill, so you change the connection at some time step t plus 1 such that you do the derivative of this function here, downhill, down means minus, epsilon is a certain step width, you jump somehow. Uh, you could sort of change this algorithm to go to always the, local, the next local minimum, but that's very CPU intensive and not realistic. So there are algorithms to do that, but in real life it doesn't really work. In real life what works much better is to do little tiny steps. By the way, that's one of the free hyperparameters you choose. Uh, the problem is it gets you in some situations into local minima. You get out of the local minima by having an uphill move and the uphill move essentially is you have a new parameter, so those are the free parameters of a neural network plus the number of hidden units and the way you choose the input features. Uh, this is the momentum, what people often refer to that. You simply take the change from the time step before and you go uphill with that. Um, now, so the idea behind it is you take, you present every single sample in your data set once and then you do a change. So the T is given by presenting samples. Uh, when you train your networks, typically you choose this number to be close to one in the beginning. Uh, and so you make it very, very fast. Typically, this is sort of ten, uh, one tenth of that one here. Uh, but then you, when, once you know how the problem is, is, is right, you make it smaller and smaller and smaller. The smaller this is, the longer the CPU time, but the smoother the training. So once you know how to basically set up your system, you will use a number that is as small as possible. That will give you the best results. And then you see something such as this one. What do I show? Two curves. Training time, essentially the presentation time. And now this is not error, this is uh, accuracy, so it's one minus error. 100% uh, means correct, completely correct classification. And I have two data sets. What are these two data sets? So there could be very specific data sets. The typical interpretation of this figure would be uh, whatever those two sets are, this is the point at which overtraining begins. So if it, is, if it were, as Paul says, that is a very specific data set and this sort of a more general uh, data set, then you see that the one data set behaves differently from the other. Since you want to have something that, that is sort of for all data sets, somehow something goes happens here that is specific to some data set, data set, only to the green set, not to the, to the more genera, generic or general data set, the blue one. Uh, I have to make this point again and again and again. This is the way you find it in textbooks. This is essentially what is referred to as overfitting, overtraining. Uh, and in real life, this is almost never what you observe. I'll, I'll show you some other case. So essentially, what we typically say is this is training set here, and this is referred to as a cross-training set, a testing set, the validation set. There are different words for that. And I'll get into some of these words in a moment. Uh, let's get back. My circle represents all the known data. Okay. Now, the point is I develop a prediction method on all the data I have today. And the data that I have today I believe, I, I have to assume that the data that I have today is representative of what I'm going to see tomorrow. All right? Because if that wouldn't be the case, I cannot develop a prediction method. At least, the, what else can I do? I cannot, there is only the data I have to, today, and if I know absolutely that I cannot, that the data tomorrow will be completely different, and that the data today has no relevance for the data of tomorrow, then I have to simply say I cannot develop a method. Okay? I will assume, if I develop a method, and I always begin with the assumption that what I have today somehow is relevant for tomorrow. There may be an oversimplification. There may be completely new things that I will discover tomorrow. But at least for some of the things that I will see tomorrow, they will be like what I see today. Okay, that's the first important assumption. And there's nothing else I can do than use today's data or not develop a method at all. Okay, those are essentially the two options I have. Now, the next question to you becomes, uh, I write here all experimental data, all available experimental data. Is that right? So the conclusion is, I have to split my data I have to remove from the available data the redundant part and after I've done that, so all 
my available non-redundant experimental data. When, once I have that, I have to split that, for instance, into two sets. Into a set that is called training, which I use in order to train the neural network, and a set testing. Okay, <coughs> what is the testing set used for? For validation. Often this is also called a validation set. So it's essentially used to see how well my method performs, right? Okay, now I have the situation where I see that method one uses 50 hidden units, method two uses 25 hidden units, method one gets 62, Q3, and method two gets 65. On the same data set, of course. Um, now what? That's what you observe. And the conclusion is what? Uh, number of hidden units. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for that. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you're moving away from us that I have to think you want to say something. <laughs> uh, so. The 25 is 50 is too complex, so like it tries to find things that aren't. Okay. So, okay. My let, let's turn this around. Um, I conclude. I write. In my, in my abstract, uh, my method works best with 25 hidden units and its performance is 65%. And that is wrong. Why? With the data that you have, it worked like that. It's other data no. That no, that's, <laughs> that's not. But based on what I tested in the end, but what I tested in the end is why 25 works best. That's exactly the kind thing. Of trained it on the test set now. This is exactly the issue. What I'm doing here is the question really is I said Q3 on the same data set is 62% or 65%. What I didn't tell you is which set that is. Is it training set or testing set? If it is testing set, and again, not again, in most publications you will see that people do exactly what I do. It is absolutely wrong, but it's exactly what they do. And this is like I put my test set under the table, I pretend I don't see it, but then I look at it for my hidden units, ah, oh, this is better. So I take my head test set out for optimizing a hyperparameter, for saying 50 is worse than 25. And that means people typically refer to that as a hyperparameter, making a decision, using the test set to make a decision. And that I cannot do. The idea is to use the test set exactly only for one thing, which is at the end of the day I say performance is XYZ. That's the only way I can use it, not to make a decision. Because then I use it to train, essentially. How could I avoid that? So essentially we have a threefold uh, training. And there are different ways in which people use these words. Uh, I, I introduced this, this term cross-training, in fact it's not I, this was suggested by some reviewer a few years ago. And I really don't know who the reviewer was. Uh, and I like it because, I immediately picked it up, I like it very much because it clearly tells you it is related to training sort of has in, in it that it is something about optimization, something about training. It's somehow like that. It's more like that than like that. Why is it mattering to me? Well, some people call this one validation and this testing. And other communities call this validation and this testing, which is totally confusing. And, and all communities have a reason for calling it. But if you can confuse it, this one you can no longer confuse. This is sort of uh, in, in the wording, that's why I use that. Anyway, so in this particular case, you would use that for hyperparameter optimization. Now, let's get back to the issue of overtraining. Here's a real case, a real world example. Uh, this is the Q3, this is the training set, and this is the test set. The first thing you observe is it is actually not as simple to find out where the overtraining is. Where would you put the point of overtraining? Okay, uh, so here, here. So one uh, absolutely, so the, if in the algorithm you would say pick the highest point, that is seven. That is this point. You could also argue, well, 
uh, why this is true here, actually the first, this is not much higher than this. Uh, and there's a lot of sort of over-optimization that happens between these two, these two points. So to be sort of conservative, I stay here. You can even go a step further. You could argue, well, the first time that the slope changes, that the green slope is much higher than the, the blue slope is sort of this point here. So here. Is this the first time where things slow down? So maybe to be very, very, very conservative, you, you, you stop here or something like that. Uh, then there is another way of, of saying that if you believe that a lot of the data that you have today will also be there tomorrow. So you actually want to benefit from, from, from some higher point and pick sort of a relatively similar high point where, where, the train, where you do allow some overtraining. So it's, it, it is, different points are, are defendable is what I'm trying to say. And Paul is totally right. What the method typically implemented would buy you something like optimal part, as simple as that, right? But there's something else here that is wrong in the coloring. Is that on the training data or is that on the... Uh, that's training data, yeah. Because that's the dark green is the pure training and aren't we interested yeah. in the cross training? Yes, exactly. That's really exactly the point that I'm going to try to make. So we have to make the decision on when we stop. It's not in the slides. Uh, that's just what I did before I was sitting here. Uh, before I was sitting. Uh, before we started. Uh, so the decision on where to stop has to be done exactly on this cross training set. Okay, that's the, the point of the slide. And again, so this is very different from, from the typical toy example. Let's get back to the signal structure prediction. Uh, the problems of methods had been, they are not 100%, Peter Strand is sort of random, uh, and they're short segments. Okay, let's, let's just, we now have, <coughs> we put the neural network into this, and onto this problem, and the way we do that is we do cut out 13 consecutive residues from a sequence. Each one of these yellow blurbs here is presenting 20 amino acids, so it's actually 20 input units. So what I show here is 13 times 20, um, which is the sparse encoding. Uh, we could do it in different ways. But the, or today people call that the hot encoding, but it turns out sparse encoding is actually the best way of doing it. When you look in more detail, you see that there is another unit here. It's actually not 20, it's 21. Why do we need that? Yeah? Fair enough, fair enough, fair enough, fair enough, no. Uh, so there are some, uh, some strange amino acids and the number could be higher and then you would, no, assume that that is not the answer. So assume that there were really only 20 amino acids. So there, there is some issue that we have to, to handle, but that is in fact not the reason why we need another unit. So if there would be 22 or 23 or 24, whatever the number is of strange things, we would still need one more. Why do we need still one more? We need a spacer. As I, I like to call it. Any idea why? So the way I do that, I did not make, I did not spend enough time on this. Uh, the way I do that, I predict the secondary structure of the central residue in this window. So in the window shown, I predict secondary structure for this proline here, which happens to be in this particular case in a strand. So the output answers to the question, what is the signal structure of this residue? Okay. Given five, I, so that is I, so I minus five, uh, the, all the residues to I minus five and I plus five, right? So in this particular case, it's 30 consecutive. I get a problem at the end of the beginning of the sequence because I don't have anything exactly. afterwards. Exactly. Mm -hmm. If I move this window to the point of this being residue number uh, six, okay, but what about residue number five? So one way of, of, of solving this issue, I could argue, well, I'm not going to predict. So the first five residues and the last five residues in a protein, I will not predict. You immediately see that for proteins of 100 residues, you, by this you throw away 10% of the protein. So this, this is not a good solution, right? And if the window, window would be longer, you would throw away more. So the, this becomes increasingly uh, less a good solution. The alternative to that is you simply introduce a spacer unit. 
You introduce a unit that is on for when you are before, right? So if, the, if, you, if say that would be the first residue, the D would be the first residue in the protein, then all, or the central residue would be the first, then the five before would all have this unit on. No amino acid outside the protein is essentially what it would code for. Right, and the last ones too. Is, is that clear? No? It didn't make click. Um, so let's just assume we, we, we have uh, this is my first resume, my second, my third, and my fourth, and so forth. Now I have a window of three. And I, in my window of three, I want to start with the one. Be, the, the central residue is this residue, my first in the protein. So this is my window here, and this is my protein. In order to have a window of three with this one in the center, I have to move the window one up. So there will be, in this window of three here, there will be one before, and that will be the spacer unit. And equally, if, if you have somehow the last one, same thing. There will be the last residue, and then there will be one after that. Right? And since that is a window of uh, 13, there will be six spacers in the end. Um, now, how well does the, the uh, neural network, this machine learning device, predict? And ultimately the answer is 62%, uh, which in fact means that the machine learning device did not in any way do better. Uh, what I did not do here, I forgot to, to uh, get this slide right, when you now look at how well do you, so the problem number one, not 100% is not addressed. You're not doing better. Problem number two, how do you do for beta strands, is not changed at all. It's also just a little bit better than random, it's sort of 40%. Um, but now, actually, there's something that the machine learning allows you to do. It allows you to simply scan what happens while you're training. This is while you're training, the training time, so to speak, uh, where every single time step is you present all the samples you have once. Okay? That's one, twice, three times, four, so this is 10 times. This one here is the accuracy to which you predict these three states, each of the three states. Uh, where this blue is beta strand, red alpha helix, and green other, the state other. So this essentially would be the percentage of correctly predicted beta strands, percentage of correctly predicted alpha helices, and other. So I hold the point that beta strand is somehow learnable. And that if I had stopped at the beginning, I would have missed that reality, that some of the beta strand can be learned. Uh, again, overall, if I look at the entire circle here being the fraction of all correctly predicted residues, then that is the fraction of the correctly predicted residues that were helices, and that is beta strand, and that is the state other. This second circle is the fraction of all the residues. That's a fraction of correctly predicted, fraction of all residues. What do you see? Beta strands are like least amount. That's true. This, the blue is the smallest. I, I, I sort of see more than that. Yeah, so it must look identical. Yeah, that is the. Maybe that is ex <laughs> that they look very similar. To, to, does this give you an idea? Now maybe we've learned all that we can from our data. Huh. <laughs> Why? So, given the distribution, yes. Oh, it learned the distribution. It learns the distribution. How could you test by changing the distribution? So, let's just try where we, in fact, change the distribution, right? And one way of changing the distribution. So the way this thing works is you change your connection at with one, you, you randomly sample all your, your samples, your training sample. Uh, randomly sampling means you sample them in the way they exist in the database, right? You pick at one, at every single time point, you pick a helix that is 30% 30 of the cases, so the probability of picking an H residue is 30%, right, on average. Uh, and you're just tweaking that by every single time doing, picking one from each of the three classes. Which means you oversample the, the lowest class, which is be, uh, be strand. You will oversample that because you're now forced to every single time point pick one from each. Okay? Uh, 
So completely balanced in that sense, you balance that all three states are equally distributed, which is tweaking the real distribution. So you change the real distribution and you just present them during training in equal numbers. This is the unbalanced, this is the balanced. And so the, the red, as you see, disappears behind there simply because exactly the same curve. What you get as a result is a method of which the correct predictions are this. Now, the Q3, unfortunately, is a little bit lower. It has to be lower because you predict the, the minority, minority state better, so overall you make more mistakes. It's just the way it is, right? But there's a very, very important reality that comes when you see that. You remember this argument? Beta strand is predicted less accurately because it's more long range. Is that true? Absolutely not. Because I have not used any long range information. I've, used, I've just changed the composition of my database, done nothing else. I've not even done that. I've just oversampled my, my data. Uh, because in my assessment here, I use the original distribution. I'm not even sort of cutting my data set. I use exactly the same data set, only change the dynamics of, of, of the way the system learns the data. That's all, right? Uh, and you produce exactly the same, yes? It's one out of make three different classifiers. So that is now, the, the, unfortunately, you're totally going many steps ahead. Um, so the question then becomes, how do I actually, since that overall has a better number, this has sort of a better feature, how do I sort of do the best of both worlds? And I actually end up having a bunch of different classifiers that I then average. Indeed, that's, that is unfortunately the way out. But it also shows you that if you sort of understand your data, then you can actually learn something about the problem that is highly non-trivial and that people who are experts in the field have overlooked for years. Um, so they said that beta strand is local makes a lot of sense, but not all sound explanations are right. Okay, let's get to the next issue. The next issue is that there are short segments. So a typical uh, observation is that a beta strand on average is five residues long, a helix is sort of 10 to 11 residues long, and that is what you get from the prediction. How could that be? How could it be, in fact, you have cases where the machine learning predicts an isolated H residue. Although we know this is not true. How can that be? How could the system learn that? Uh, I again repeat the way the training is done. You go downhill in this error landscape. And the way you go downhill is you pick, for every single time step, you pick samples. Or in the balance, you pick three at random. And then you move on and you optimize the function. Why would that system be as dumb to predict a single residue as a helix? So the, the best way to bring that back in is to stack neural networks. So the way to read that is that this is an entire network that is what I described before. It has three output units for helix, strand, other. Okay. Now I use the prediction of the first level. So I develop a method that predicts segmental structure just like I said before. That has the problem that segments are too short. And I use that as an input to a new neural network. In this particular case, all it sees is the secondary structure prediction for the first level. Okay? So it's three input units. Again, there must be a spacer. That's why it's four. Okay? Uh, so three for the first residue, the second residue, and the third. Now, I only show three residues here, but this actually can... It will be the 13 or even longer windows, okay? And the output will be exactly the same, nothing else. And if I only do that, then on the second level, you get this out, which is, as, as you see in terms of comparison to the observed, very similar. We can sort of do that. Uh, we can now look over all what's, how often do we predict segments of that length and that length, we can look at the frequency and we see that experimental and predicted are relatively similar. So it works very well. Uh, and incidentally, uh, this idea was first introduced by uh, the first method that I'm aware of, Chana and Sinovsky, applying neural networks to secondary structure prediction. Uh, 
And they had applied the same idea for improving the overall performance. It didn't work. That's why they essentially sort of uh, didn't, didn't pursue this idea. They never realized that it actually works for the segments. They had used it to, to improve Q3, didn't work for that, so it had been thrown away and had been somehow lost in the literature. Uh, and this is another example where, in fact, I rediscovered this simply I had forgotten that they had used it because it had not worked. Uh, and I had even given a talk about that talk, but I had still forgotten it because it, that aspect didn't work. So it was not stored in, in, my, in, my, in my brain. And since I had forgotten it, I could reinvent it. Uh, and I, I reinvented it for, clearly for that purpose. Uh, and for that purpose, it absolutely worked. Uh, so there is a slightly different we talked about that already, uh, Paul's idea. Another way of doing that goes back to Gianluca Polastri or uh, the, somebody in Pierre Baldi, uh, but there's somebody else who is un Fras uh, Paolo Frasconi here, that's the publication I meant, where essentially what you do is you feed back the prediction into the neural network. You have a feedback uh, today referred to as LSTMs. Uh, so that's another way of doing that. So essentially you, you wire the network uh, differently and they work very well. Uh, LSTMs are in deep learning everywhere now. Uh, they are slightly more complicated to train, but it works here too. But still, at the end of the day, we have the only problem that the prediction performance is still about 60 something percent. So we do better on beta strands, we do better on segments, we have improved two aspects through the right way of using machine learning, but we still have not sort of captured this, this main issue of the 60 percent. So, and that is where we get into the, the third generation methods to, to cut down on the 60 percent number, and how can we do that? So, the real answer is we somehow need to bring in more information into that, uh, into that window and ultimately answer is homology. Uh, let me explain that. Again, I'm back to the HSP curve, number of residues aligned, percentage sequence identity, everything above the blue line essentially has a similar 3D structure, if naturally observed. For instance, if you have 100 residues aligned and more than 33 of those are identical, these two proteins essentially have the same 3D structure, which means to turn that around. In 100 you can change 67 and you maintain structure. Now, I go to the lab, I change five residues and I change the structure. How come nature can change 67 and I can do only five? Well, you can argue that is sort of my limitation because I'm a very limited, I'm a theoretical person because I cannot do that. Uh, but it's also true nature has much more time. And in fact nature has the time to make the very unlikely thing come true. A neutral variant is very unlikely. Most variants are going to knock out something. And nature will only, only those will survive. We see only those that work, right? All the things, the most things that don't work, we don't see. That ultimately is the, 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 the secret underneath. And that, to turn that around. This means that where my protein I can change, what is very informative. That is, when you look at the simple uh, sequence alignment, for instance, this one here, you see of the SH3 family uh, that essentially there are four more or less entirely conserved columns here. When you look at where these th columns fall onto the structure, you see that the first one comes here and the last one comes here. This is not stereo, it's two different sides of the molecule. You see that this one and that one here, they are somehow similar in space. Now, since they are similar in space, what happens here, in terms of sequence space here, will affect what happens here. Why? Because it will move everything? Well, what do you mean, will move everything? Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but why? Yes. Your, your hands tell the story, but your, your mouth is not behind your hands yet. I mean, the, the mouth catch up. If you substitute a different amino acid, you will have slight movements that will reverberate basically throughout the entire protein. Exactly. So you have a slight movement here that will affect this residue because they are bound. Put it differently, uh, any, any change at this time of the sequence will lead will be recovered 
by a change, uh, can be recovered by a change. You make this bigger and this smaller. You make this negative, say it's a, it's a uh, negative and a positive. You, f you switch this to a positive, you will switch this. And that is exactly what you will see here. That will mean that if you, in fact, cut out a window of, say, five consecutive residues in the back here, and you look at this entire profile of changes that happen, that in that window of five, you see something that comes from somewhere else in my sequence. So you have actually a cutout window of a profile of five, and that has information about the world outside those five. This is unique. This is like, you know, this old story of you, know, you have a raindrop in which you see the world. It really is like that. Because this evolves as a three-dimensional object. And what you see is something that evolved to a similar structure, to a particular function. And these constraints, you may not be able to look at it and, and sort of say this is why, but you have it in there. Okay? And that information is exactly what you try to use. If you, by the way, think about this in terms of, of, of problems, uh, then the, the protein folding is a problem of this type. So tiny changes can change where the, limit, where, the, where, the low, where the minimum is of the story. And essentially what you do by looking at this evolutionary signal, you sort of convert it from, from a chaos-like type of problem into a simple solvable problem by, con by sort of averaging over different sequences, what you call homologs, essentially. Now how would you do that in terms of the secondary structure prediction method? Well, you would simply replace this sparse coding, or one hot encoding as it's called today, uh, by an alignment. So now you take the sequence as you have it before, you build up homologs in alignment, and every single position here, you put in whatever is the profile. For instance, the proline in the middle here, this still is, proline is all on. But for the D, for instance, you have 80% uh, D and 20% T. So four and one here. Uh, and essentially you replace the ones and zeros vector by this real number that is the profile, the position specific profile from your, your sequence alignment. And you change nothing else. You put the same sort of neural network uh, and you do it all like that. And essentially, then in order to predict signature structure, the problem has become a little bit more complicated. Now you have to sort of get the alignment information, you decide with the sequence, you align, you find the homologs according to that threshold, you align them, you put the profile into these two stacked networks, uh, and these are the two stacked networks, you add some additional information, then you do it that many times, that is what Paul talked about, one is better in, in predicting alpha uh, beta strands, one is better in predicting overall, so you average over all of these, and then you sort of get uh, a system here the system is even more complicated in the next version we sort of uh, add, add some more additional information and then you get sort of a third generation method uh, that then was called PhD the, the first simple implement implementation of it uh, and had an overall prediction performance of sort of 72 percent